sorted. So, uh, just to go through, apologies for absence. We have Councillor Fitzpatrick. Um, any other apologies? Right. Ian Hodgson we've received apologies from. Right. And I notice there are a number of people who are not here, Chair. Um, I don't know whether they'll be arriving later. They, they may be arriving later. Okay, right. Um, item four, declarations of interest. Anything? No? Right, so that brings us on to item five with uh, Mr. Mark Jones. He's going to give a short talk and question and answer session. Sorry, if I may introduce Mark. Mark came in uh, to uh, our school, Ralph Butterfield uh, Primary School, to basically speak about um, Buddhism and to talk about his beliefs and the way he lives his life with the children. Um, he led a assembly with all of the pupils in the school, uh, first with Key Stage 2, then with Key Stage 1 in the early years, and then did a series of workshops where the children had the opportunity to look at resources, to take part in a a meditation session and really to, to ask some, um, some questions of, of Mark. Um, this, we decided, was a good thing to do as a school um, due to the, uh, the, base, the faith based in, in York and the fact that we do have quite a, a Buddhist population and actually we have been welcoming other faith members in to speak of their faith. So this was part of that sort of effort to get as many sort of different... Um, uh, people in to speak with the children to give them that broad experience so um yeah well and it was brilliant if i can say as well to be quite frank it was absolutely fantastic and the children got a lot from that experience so, yeah. uh, thank you um can you hear me darius can you hear me good <laughs> okay um yes yeah, so thank you for inviting me to uh, to to speak um so my um my background, if you like, I've been a Buddhist for 32 years, practicing Buddhist uh, in Birmingham and then in York. I've also been a Buddhist chaplain at uh, Full Sutton um, Prison and um, Ascombe Grange. Um, I was an RE teacher as well, high school RE teacher. Uh, became an RE teacher when I was, when I was 50. Um, and I co-founded York Buddhist Centre, um, which is as of today in Warmgate in York. We've, uh, we've just had the keys to new premises, so we're, it's an exciting time for us. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, is just briefly outline the, the basic Buddhist beliefs, uh, because I think there's some misconceptions sometimes about what Buddhists actually do, particularly in the West, because Western Buddhism and Eastern Buddhism is, is very, very different. Um, although it, obviously it, it's, it, there are similarities, but the way that, uh, that we live our lives is, is quite different. Um, so the Buddha, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, um, the Buddha's first teaching was the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths was that in the world there is suffering, people suffer. Um, that's the first Noble Truth. And he saw this. Um, le le legend has it that he, he was a prince and he went out to, to see the world and when he went out to see the world he saw what they call the four sights so he saw old, old age, sickness, death and he also saw a monk or a, wander a wandering man and uh, he wanted to be like that man that man seemed to sort of just glide through the world without this suffering so he, he was on this quest to try and find out how to eradicate suffering in the world um, so the first noble truth was that, that, um, that there is suffering in the world. The second noble truth is that there is a cause of suffering. So suffering doesn't just happen. Um, suffering is actually quite neutral. Um, the cause of suffering uh, is, is the second noble truth. And that cause of suffering, which is the third noble truth, is, uh, is usually greed or what Buddhist term as greed, it's, it's not necessarily... Um, 
it's not necessarily as bad as that, but it's, it's kind of wanting things to be different to how they are. So either um, we can suffer because um, things aren't the way that we want them to be, or we can suffer because we want more of the things that, that we like. So basically, the, um, the, yeah, so the third noble truth is that the cause of suffering is, is greed and also hatred and aversion. So generally in our lives, we're either moving towards something, we're moving towards wanting something, or we're trying to get away from something that's, that's happening to us or something that we don't like. And as Buddhists, we're trying to sort of steer a middle path so that we don't get too caught up in, in, in sort of sensual pleasure, if you like. Um, not to say that we don't have fun as Buddhists, but we don't sort of try and get, you know, grasping for, for sensual pleasure. Um, but also we don't walk away from pain and suffering. We acknowledge that that's going on in, in the world and, and also in our lives. Um, and then the fourth noble truth that was the way out of suffering is what, the, uh, what later became known as the Eightfold Noble Path. So basically a way to live your life to overcome uh, this idea of suffering so that we, become, we just become happier. So suffering exists... The Buddha says it's because um, of, of greed, hatred, and, and what he called delusion, and the way out is to follow, these, uh, follow this eightfold path. Um, and the, the other really important teaching about Buddhism is um, that everything is impermanent. So nothing, nothing at all that exists is going to exist forever or in its current state, uh, and that includes ourselves. So we're changing. We're changing on a minute-by-minute minute basis. We're changing. We can, we can hear something, and it changes us. We can see something, it changes us. Uh, our bodies are changing. You know, as I'm getting older, I'm realising that more and more. Um, so our bodies are changed. So nothing's, nothing's permanent. And we become unhappy because we, we often think it is. We often think things are going to last forever. We want things to last forever, and they don't, so that makes us unhappy. So we want our bodies always to be in tip-top physical condition, and you, know, you get to this age, and they sort of um, go on a little bit of a decline. Um, or people die around us, and we miss people. We want them to be there all the time, and they're not there. So again, we, we, we're suffering. There's, there's this suffering going on. Um, and it's because... Um, as human beings, we don't necessarily recognise this. If we could recognise this, we'd actually suffer less, that things uh, come into being, they continue, and then they cease to be. And that's, kind of the, the, that's, that's basically what the Buddha taught, that things arise, things continue, and then things cease. And, and that applies to absolutely, absolutely everything. And... Um, this arising uh, is always based on conditions. So nothing exists unless the conditions to bring it into being also exist, uh, including ourselves. So we, we sit here as, as, as human beings, uh, we identify ourselves, we call ourselves by a name, and we believe that we're a certain type of person, maybe. But actually, all, what we are is, is a set of conditions. So we're a set of our, our education, our, our parentage, um, just the way that the world has treated us thus far. So again, um, it's what we're trying to do as Buddhists is to, is to make these conditions more, more positive. We're trying to move away from negative conditionality and move into something more positive. Um, so how do we do this? Well... Um, First of all, not, not all Buddhists are the same. So in the West, we tend not to have monastic Buddhists. We tend to live fairly normal lives in the world, particularly in, in the true Ratna community, which, which I belong to. Um, we can have jobs, we can have families. Um, I'm going to a, a concert in, a, in about an hour and a bit. You know, we can go and, we can go and do that. We can do, do basically anything that we want. Uh, there are no rules in Buddhism at all. Um, the Buddha really wasn't prescriptive. Um, what he was prescriptive about really is, is the intention. So the intention, our intentions are far more in Buddhism are far more important than our actions because our actions, we don't necessarily know whether they're going to be skillful or unskillful at the time that we, we commit them. 
So we might think we're doing the right thing. It might turn out to be the wrong thing. But if the intention was there, then that's, that's skillful Buddhist practice. Um, but we do have some guidelines um, that we, we follow. And when we become Buddhists, we kind of take on these, these precepts and try and live our, our lives by these precepts, uh, which are really important. They're central to, to what we do. Um, so one of them is to refrain from harming so we try as far as possible not to harm uh, any living being. Uh, that might uh, mean that we go vegetarian or vegan, uh, but you know, not, not necessarily a lot of Buddhists aren't, but we try and re refrain from harming. And then the, the positive side is that, is that we try and show loving kindness wherever we can. So everything that we do has to come from a, 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 a kindness, or what we call metta, um, loving kindness perspective. Um, then we refrain from taking what is the not given, uh, which can mean you know we don't steal, uh, but it can also mean taking people's time, or taking people's attention, or or taking the credit for something that we haven't done. There are there are lots of things we can take. And one of the really interesting things um, that we did with with Andy's kids was ask them what what can we take from people, you know, and and the the, the range of answers was absolutely superb. Uh, one, uh, one girl said you could take someone's heart, which was, <laughs> which was lovely. I don't think I could speak for a minute after that. It was just so nice. Um, and then the, the positive side is that is practicing generosity. So we try and give uh, wherever we can. The um, third one is refraining from what is described as sexual misconduct, which is a really difficult one to teach to... Um, early years. Um, so we try, we, we take it as being sort of uh, misuse of the senses, if you like. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's really trying not to get too attached, too attached to, to sort of sensual experience, which, which can involve um, sexual experience. So we try and practice simplicity and contentment, uh, particularly in, in relationships. Uh, refraining from wrong speech is the fourth one and the most difficult one because we're speaking all the time. Um, and our, our very next word can be harmful or it could be joyful or you know, it could have a positive or negative effect. So we try as, as much as possible to refrain from wrong speech. And this might mean, well, certain, certainly we try to tell the truth. Um, we try not to gossip, although everybody loves a bit of gossip. Um, but it's basically, if we're going to speak, to try and make it as, as positive and as beneficial and as harmonious as possible. Um, so we practice kindly speech. And then we refrain, refrain from intoxicants that cloud the mind, which I think in the Buddha's day was quite simple. Uh, these days, there's so many things that can, can cloud the mind. Uh, we're not just talking about alcohol or drugs. We're talking about internet. We're talking about phones. We're talking about television, films, anything, anything games, computer games. Um, so again, you know, with the, with with um, with your uh, children, they, were, they came up with loads of things that could cloud the mind. Yeah, most of which they were doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they did admit to do, doing them all. So, so the flip side of that is that we we try and practice mindfulness. We try and sort of reduce the input, if you like, so that we've got more time um, or, or clearer clearer minds. Um, we have festivals, we celebrate uh, festivals, we have what they call pujas, which are actually a Hindu tradition that we've sort of adopted as Buddhists. Um, it was around uh, the time of the Buddha, so a lot of, a lot of what the Buddha taught to now a thousand years ago would have come from what was later to be, going, to be called Hinduism. Um, so a lot of cultural, um, cultural um, ideas have sort of permeated into, into Buddhism. And you find that when Buddhism goes into different countries, wherever it goes, it kind of adopts the culture. Um, so that's why you get different Tibetan Buddhists. They're, they're different to Western Buddhists or Indian Buddhists or Chinese Buddhists. Um, but we all do things in common. So we have pujas, which are kind of a, an emotional way of engaging with the teachings of the Buddha, if you like. Um, Wesak, which is Buddha Day, I think most most Buddhists would celebrate uh, Buddha's Buddha's uh, well Buddha's birth, and then Parinirvana, which some Buddhists see as being the death of the Buddha, and some people see as being the birth of the Buddha. 
um, and very often it's sort of the Buddha's enlightenment celebrating. So there's there's usually three or four festivals that we we have <coughs> every uh, every year, um, and we practice. Well, certainly the, the the Western Buddhists we practice at home. Um, so a lot of us have shrines at home. We meditate for get up and meditate for 40, 50 minutes a day in the morning uh, before we do anything. Uh, and also we uh, practice in the Buddhist center. Um, and the Buddhist center is very important because uh, Buddhism can be seen as being a sort of isolationist practice, really. You know, you're sitting there on a the cushion for 40 minutes and it's, it's all going on in your head. Um, but actually, the, the community, the Buddhist community, is, is probably the most important part for Buddhists. It's what we call Sangha. And um, the Buddha was asked once whether, you know, how, how important was friendship to the spiritual life? And his reply was, well, friendship is the spiritual life. You know, it's, it's, it's that important that we don't practice on our own, that we've got plenty of support from uh, from other Buddhists around us. So at your Buddhist centre, which, you know, we try and sort of get... Um, well, widen the sangha, if you like, um, which which we've, we've done over the last four and a half years since since we started it. Um, so meditation is central. I mean, ethics, which is the the five precepts I spoke about, meditation and wisdom are the three, what we call the threefold Buddhist path. Um, and strangely, we always teach meditation before we teach ethics. And really, we should be teaching ethics before meditation because if you're not living an ethical life, meditation is very difficult because you've got all this baggage going on. Um, but in reality, it's easier to teach meditation first because if you advertise an ethics class, you won't get many people coming. If you advertise meditation, you, you stand a chance. Um, so we, we always always have done it the other way around in most Buddhist traditions. And then this leads to wisdom. So the threefold path are, are ethics. Sort your ethics out, get your meditation right, and that leads to sort of wisdom and, and insight. Um, and then finally, as, as Buddhists, what we, what we, we do is we uh, go for what we call refuge to the three jewels. And the three jewels are the, the Buddha, who we see as being a perfect human being, uh, the Dharma, which is the Buddha's teachings, and the teachings that have come after the Buddha, uh, and the Sangha, which is the, the spiritual community. Um, so very often you'll see Buddhists bowing three times, and, and it's because they're bowing to those three three jewels that become central to their life. And that's about it. That's Buddhism in ten minutes. <laughs> Yeah, if you've got... Uh... Yeah. Um, obviously, Andy, you've invited um, into school today to do work with schools. Do you, do you advertise so that schools know that you're available to come in and we do We are going to. Brilliant. Yeah, we've done it. It's, it's been a bit word of mouth, and it's been yeah. a, bit, a bit haphazard. Like, you know, somebody sort of um, asks somebody else if they know anybody else, and... Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a bit haphazard. So what we're trying, what we're doing now at York Buddhist Centre, and this will happen from September, is we're going to actually put on the website um, what we can offer. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. And also uh, what we will charge, because mm -hmm. again, yeah. you know, it's we've very often done it for free. Well, it, it, there is a lot involved mm. in it. You know, we're all full, we work full time, so we have to sort of you know have a day off work or whatever it is to do. So there will be some some charges on there. Um, and also we're going to invite people to come to the Buddhist Centre as well so that they can actually see Fantastic. what goes on at the Buddhist Centre. Yeah. That's brilliant because we, we do have a visit and visitors list because often schools email and ask for that and it would be great to, yeah, to yeah. put those details on there um, because obviously uh, until recently schools were travelling to Pocklington to the Majimaka Centre yeah. um, and it would be great to have a a local yeah. example and a local Buddhist centre that they could visit. So yeah, that'd be fantastic. yeah. I mean, I'm setting up again when when we're moving. I'm setting up a team of maybe three or four people um, that that can do it, <laughs> because I can't do. You know, I'd love to do more, but I can't can't do it every time. 
And so we're setting up a sort of educational team, and what we're going to do is produce resources as well. So if people come to us or we go out to somewhere, we can actually do do something rather than every time we go to a school at the moment, we have to sort of you know decide what it is we're going to do. So we're going to say this is this is what who we are. This is this is what we can do. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was really really interesting. Um, can I just ask a couple of questions? Um, Firstly, how large is the uh, Buddhist community within York? And secondly, um, I don't know, do, is, is Buddhism a profitizing religion or not? Um, no. It, that's the second question. No, it, it isn't. Um, we, would, we don't go out and, and market Buddhism, if you like, except, uh, you know, we do our Facebook and, and all the rest. But, you know, we do that, uh, but no. But you don't have a mission. To we don't have a world mission. Buddhist. No, no. We, oh no, no, no. Uh, I think it was Tish Nakhan. Tish Nakhan say the world doesn't need more Buddhists. It just needs more good people. So it's 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 kind of that. Um, the first question: How how big is the Buddhist community? Well, uh, it's not very big in in York. There's the Pocklington um, Kadampa tradition, which is separate from everybody else. Actually, they they kind of do keep themselves very, very separate. Um, about three years ago, I set up the York um, Buddhist Network and discovered that there were about six different groups in, in York. Now, since COVID, most of those groups have folded because um, they, they were only, there were you know, probably about seven or eight members. Um, but each uh, November, we put on, a, as part of Interfaith, we put on a, an evening uh, for people to come to that, which I think Darius has, has, has certainly been to. Um, um, and our, our Sangha, if you like, is probably about 50 people in all. In York. But, you know, we've, I mean, until very recently we were meeting at the Quaker Centre uh, and then we've, we had a little, we've had a little centre in Gilligate for a year and a half, which has been closed mostly because of COVID. Um, so now we, we expect to get to get fairly large, I think. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mark. That was uh, very interesting. I was wondering, when you were talking about the festivals that occur, do they occur in... Uh, well, I can't think of another way of putting it, but a kind of a worldly year, or is there a religious year? Which is calculated on a different timeline. Yeah, they're, they're normally to do with the full moons. So whenever, the, you know, for example, Wesak would always be around the full the, the full moon in May, because we think that's when the Buddha reached <coughs> enlightenment. Yeah. So just, if I may just take that a little bit further, so of course the, you'd have thirteen moons in a year. And a couple of days to spare. Yeah. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, it sounds a bit mundane, but I'm just trying to relate the reliance on full moons or the sequence of the moons rising and falling to, um, to if you like, our normal day-to-day -day life. Since you've said on the one hand, well, there's no reason why you can't have a normal day. I use the word normal in quotes there. A normal day-to-day -day life. Mm. Um, and the kind of the, the 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 number of impositions on you as an individual, I would guess they're relatively small, but there are these paths and these groups of behaviours and performances, mm. um, and yet the year is very tied to the same year that oh, yeah, mundane yeah. people. It is have. absolutely yeah. Yeah, it's just that we, we, we have these three festivals. Yeah. Uh, there's usually three. There might be four or five, depends on the tradition. Mm. Um, but you know, the May one always falls closest to the full moon in May. There's mm. one in September. Mm. One in, I think the other one's July. Um, so we, we kind of just place the festivals with those, um, those dates, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. That was very useful. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Mark, thank you again for your, your presentation. Um, I, I've kind of been involved with Sacre for, for three years. Um, and I have to be honest, I've been really enlightened by listening to other 
faiths and their their you know their, their whole kind of ethos and belief and and actually what what I what I kind of noticed as you were chatting was that kind of the, the the basic principles of Buddhism and what you effectively believe actually cuts across predominantly all the religions that, that, I, that I've managed to kind of listen to. And it's almost like we could all be in one room and all kind of sing from the same, forgive me if I say the word hymn sheet, but yeah, you, you know where I'm going with that. Um, so thank you for that. But but one question that I've got, and you may have, you may have said it in your, in your talk, um, so the, the majority of the other religions that I, I'm aware of, and I, you know, I've got to confess, I'm just a, you know, a, a, an atypical white Christian male, um, you know, and, and, and that's who I am. Um, but but th there seems to be a deity um, in, in most religions. Would, would, would there be a deity in Buddhism? Would you see that Buddha was effectively a, a deity, a god, or...? Um, in some traditions, it's certainly looked at that way. For example, Chinese Buddhism, they would pray to the Buddha. And in fact, they go and place their lottery numbers on the Buddha to, you know, to give them luck. But that's more cultural than it is Buddhist. So in Buddhism, I think, I think yes, I certainly agree with you about um, religions having the same kind of ethos. I know when I was teaching it in high school, we were teaching you know, all six religions... And whenever he got to another religion, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, I've just taught this with a different name. Yeah. Um, but there isn't, in Buddhism, there isn't a, an external force. So um, you, everything that we do is, is coming from within. There isn't a, a divine being that's sort of guiding things, if you like. So Western Buddhists certainly wouldn't see the Buddha as being a, a godlike figure, no. Um, it was a, a, hu a human being, really. Uh, the, the perfected human, perfected being a human being. Yeah. So, and again, forgive me, because it is relevant. Um, so, um, it, it's interesting that whenever you go to the pub, and I appreciate you probably wouldn't go to the pub, whenever you go to the pub, you're, you're asked, you know, you say the two things you don't talk about, don't talk about politics and religion. But actually, if you look at politics, you look at religion, um, Joe Cox's words are probably true, for religion as well as for politics, that there's more that unites us than actually divides us. Uh, and I've certainly seen that in terms of my work here on, on Sacri. But coming back to, 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 to Buddhism, um, and you, you, I don't think you touched on it. If you did, f f forgive me. But, it's, but, it, but again, it's, it's, it's what, it's what non-Buddhists believe that Buddhists believe. And, and that's that, you know, what happens when we die? in terms of regeneration and recreation, what, what would the Buddhist belief be there? Because other religions tend to have some form of afterlife that you, that you aspire to go to through whatever means gets you there. Mm. I'm just wondering what the, what the Buddhist thought is on that. Well, again, it's, it's a tricky one because different Buddhists might believe different things. Even within, within our own Sangha, there are people that believe that when you die, you die. That's, that's, that's the end of it. There are others that believe that there is some kind of consciousness that... that arises again at some point in the future. What's, what's important, I think, about it is that there's a difference between reincarnation and rebirth. So in Hinduism, for example, you would have reincarnation. You have a, a, you know, a, a soul that kind of migrates to another vessel, if you like. Yeah? Um, in Buddhism, you, you don't have that. So what happens in or in Buddhist belief, or what the Buddha taught, was that thing, things arise. So we've arisen as a set of, out of a set of conditions. And then we continue for a while, and then we cease. But then we might arise at some point in the future again. If we've arisen once, there's no reason why we shouldn't do it again. It might not be the same. So, so in Buddhism, um, you, you often hear of emptiness in Buddhism, or no self. And that's because there's nothing in us that actually remains. But there may be, and we don't, we don't know this, but there may be some consciousness that maybe goes forward in, into another life. I mean, certainly, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, the Dalai Lamas, or all the Lamas, you know, they are the Lamas because they've had past lives that they can recognise. Um, so, but again, it's, it's very, very much part of the culture 
um, that it comes from um, in Indian Buddhism. Uh, a lot of it is from Hinduism that there is this sort of fixed self that goes on, or a soul, if you like, that that, that will go on and on. Um, so there isn't there isn't a di uh, really a a, a definitive well, like every religion, there isn't there isn't a definitive answer to anything. Um, but but generally, I th I think. Um, yeah, we're not trying to set up conditions in... We're not trying to, to act in this life to set up conditions in the next life. We're, we're actually doing it to set up the best conditions in this life. Uh, and if there is another life, then bingo. You know, we've, we've done it, really. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I, I just <laughs> yeah, no, I've done it now. Um, so, in terms of like teaching about Buddhism, I'm just reflecting on like how we teach about it. What would you say like the three biggest misconceptions? Because I think you've made a really good point that has helped me reflect in terms of cultural and then like religious differences. So, what would you say are like the things that you think are often mistaught and are the biggest misconceptions? I think the biggest misconception is monastics. That when we talk about Buddhism, we normally... I mean, most textbooks... I mean, I, I, I studied um, at Warwick University. I did a master's in religious education. We looked a lot. We did a, a research project on textbooks in Buddhism. And most of them will show you a monk with a begging bowl and, and all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> I think it's more important when we're teaching... Particularly teaching um, children in, in, in schools here that it's about what Buddhists in the West are doing really, because they won't see a monk walking around with a begging bowl, you know, um, and so when you, you know, if you, if you show them all that, and then they come to the Buddhist center, where we, you know, they'll be looking for the monks, and the, and the shaved heads, and, and all the rest of it, so, there is a nun there, isn't there, or there aren't some nuns there, yeah, 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 it does, yeah, 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 and if you went to Samyang um, in uh, or Jam, Jamlang in Leeds, you know you'd see monks there. So there are monks, yeah. um, but I think I think Buddhism can be very very stereotypical, and I think that's that's the danger really. Yeah. I'm very struck by your comments about what you would need to charge because everybody's a volunteer and because people have got their full-time jobs. Um, and we're in a similar situation. We get a lot of invites into schools, and I'm sure you are too. Um, you know, and in some cases, we feel we do it as a mitzvah, or you know, in other cases, you've got people who this is their job and their profession. I wonder if um, a role for Sacre is to create some guidance in this area for schools, because it's difficult for schools as well to know if to offer to pay. Often they may not invite somebody if they think they're going to be required to pay because um, they haven't got the budget. I think the challenge with offering guidance is it's tricky to say to schools to you could offer or donate. Um, but I think what might be helpful is a conversation, particularly among Committee A members and Interfaith York, um, and reassuring people that it's, it is okay to charge. I mean, the majority of visitors to schools um, for RE do charge. Many of them it is because of their job, but I, I think you're right to raise the fact that it's challenging if it's um, for free. Schools don't have a huge budget, mm. but we could perhaps look... I think, I think the challenge is that um, it's very difficult to to give guidance that would then, if, if everybody doesn't sit around the table to agree what those charges might be. Um, my experience is that working with visitors to schools using the visit and national visit and visitors guidance, that's a really helpful starting point, and then they shape what they feel is an appropriate charge, and so schools know up front what they get and how much they pay, rather than donation, if that makes sense. Can I just suggest that this um, is not an item to discuss without yeah. it being on the agenda and some yeah, things? Absolutely. But I think it would be really useful yeah. to come back yeah. to this yeah. in the next meeting because yeah. I think there are different 
ways right. you can approach it. Yeah. Yes, and I think it, in terms of schools understanding what resources are available, but also appreciating that if across the city they ask the same person, um, that's quite onerous for um, particular organisations and the young to do. So it was only just to share our experience in this situation. It was a donation, and, the, and, and Mark kindly said we'd be happy to come in and, and just come in for free, if that was so, so be it. And we as a school, we used um, uh, the PTA, and I sort of spoke to the PTA about right. this as an opportunity, and they were willing to say this is a lovely opportunity. We would be happy to put money towards that. So just in this situ situation, that's how that, that occurred, just for that context. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Right. Do uh, You've got a concert to go to. <laughs> right. Oh, well, that's... I'll see that. Right. OK, well, thank you very much. Mark, just yeah. before you do go, we don't have Buddhist representation on Saturday at the moment, so if you could take it back to your community to consider it, it would be welcome. Right. Okay, so that brings us on to item six. Uh, and I'm conscious that Ben, you sent an email to us all about a, an item that I believe we're taking in any other yes, business yes, right, yes. with relation to interfaith week. Um, so I wasn't at the meeting on the 5th of January and 30th of March, so would anyone who was there... Well, firstly, are there any items of correction or omission that people have picked out? So uh, if we go for the meeting on the 5th of January, is that a complete record? Seems like that. Okay, and the meeting on the 30th of March... Is that so? Are, are we happy to approve those as minutes of those relevant meetings? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, oh, so I just have to sign these. Just to leave them to dry. <laughs> there you go. Right. Um, and I, I suppose I should have said at the beginning, the, the distribution list um, had been superseded by annual council. So that's why... Councillor Hunter isn't here tonight. I haven't sent her apologies because um, the uh, it was Councillor Cuthbertson was included as a member, so that's what was voted through at annual council. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So that brings us on to item. So just on what you did. So is is Councillor Hunter still a member of the? Or as councillor, no, the, 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 the councillors uh, appointed as annual council were Councillor Fitzpatrick, yeah. myself, Councillor Waller, Councillor Cuthbertson, and yourself, Councillor Green. Yeah, so that's Thank the you. four. Um, okay, so monitoring of standard development plan. Yes. Um, so, as you, um, Do you want to press your button, Maxine? 
As, as uh, members are aware, the development, the current development plan um, actually runs from 2020 to 2022. It has, yeah, it's, it's, it is green. Um, so it is time now to start to think about a review of this development plan and, the de and uh, move to drafting a new development plan with um, a new set of priorities. So I felt it was useful for us just to reflect on the 2020-22 development plan and the progress that we've made against the priorities that, that were actually incorporated in that plan. So they, they, it is in your pack. And priority one was to maintain the profile of SACRE and develop religious education. So to raise awareness of and support for the work of the City of York Sacre and RE as a subject. And we said that our intended impact was that schools understand and engage with the work of Sacre and recognise the importance of RE. Now, obviously, the lifetime of this particular plan was, all, was also impacted by the COVID pandemic. And um, during much of that time, we were actually meeting remotely rather than face to face. It also as well curtailed the amount of work, the direct work that we could do with schools during that period of time, because schools in the main weren't accepting visits from um, outside agencies. And the other thing was obviously that schools themselves were very focused on their management of, of COVID rather than thinking about developments in, in different curriculum areas. But if we look at some of the actions um, and we look at what's actually been achieved during that time, um, if we look at um, the first action, which was uh, the, the website, I would say that's been sort of partially achieved. And um, I think there's a need to continue that as a priority but to think more not just about a website but also about developing a communications plan for SACRE which actually really focuses on the different ways that we can communicate and encourage knowledge of SACRE both across the school community but also um, ensure that um, the whole council understands more about uh, the statutory duties around SACRE and also um, that um, other agencies across the city like Interfaith um, are also um, more aware of, of um, what SACRE is doing and that there's that regular flow backwards and forwards of information. So I think communication, for me, remains an area for development and growth. I don't know whether you agree, Olivia. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are, um, I think the launch of the, the agreed syllabus was a, a great um, opportunity to promote SACRE and the work of SACRE and that partnership with Interfaith York. So I think there is a good momentum in the terms of the number of schools that engaged with the launch to build on. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in the paper last time was considering things such as, for example, a SACRE newsletter that goes to schools as a way of, of um, promoting things such as visits and visitors to schools, opportunities and resources, both locally and uh, nationally, would be a good way of keeping schools engaged with the work that we do. In terms of the, uh, the appointments of the SACRE chair, obviously that, that did happen um, and also we did commission support from um, an advisor to SACRE, which is Olivia. Um, so those things were completed and now ongoing because obviously we just handed the chairmanship over. Um, but it, we've got now um, a framework in which that is happening because one of the things that we said we'd do is um, review the terms of reference for SACRE and SACRE, thanks to the work of Janie, has been um, completely now refreshed and recited within the constitution of the City of York Council. So it's now firmly established in terms of its constitutional role. So we've made good, we made good progress in that area. Um, support for Holocaust Memorial Day is, it tends to be a, a thing that, that's done annually. Um, it may be, again, that we want to think about how that contribution works. Um, you may remember that the former LA advisor um, to uh, Sacre, Mike Jury, was sitting on the Holocaust Memorial Day 
um, Development Group. Uh, Mike has stepped down from that role now because obviously Mike, Mike is um, he's reduced his hours of working with City of York, so he's just now working 0.5 for us and no longer has the capacity to be the link with HMD. Um, but it would be lovely if we can get some school representation on Holocaust Memorial Day um, in terms of the steering group. Andy? Um, just to say that that is due to be raised in the coming network meeting. Thank you, Andy. Um, providing it goes ahead. I yeah. think the summer term there's, uh, might be a little less attendance than we have had earlier in the year, but it, I will get that out one Thank way or you. another. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's really, really helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, just... Oh, sorry. Just to continue with that. I've had a discussion in my school as well. We've got somebody who's willing to, to come and help out from, from Joseph Rowntree School as well. That's so excellent. Really Thank you. Yeah. As I say, I think it makes such a difference if we've got school, schools actually involved directly in it. And you can be quite key advocates for developing the programme, but also getting the, the programme publicised as well within the school community. So thanks to both of you for, for taking that on. It's, it's really valuable. Um, the... Um, AGM to um, represent York Sacre. I know, Olivia, you, you attend that, don't you? I did. I did this. This year, I was technically there um, in my role for a different Sacre, but I just put my name as York and North Yorkshire, so yeah. there was at least a sense that York was there in some form or another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, what we can see is that we, we have made progress in Area 1. We did launch the agreed syllabus um, on time and, and uh, had a, a very um, positive launch event. Um, I think, as I say, that the areas to take forward from Priority 1 is, is around communication and ensuring that we've got that regular communication with the school community and, and wider um, in terms of raising awareness of SACRE. Priority two was the agreed syllabus. We definitely have signed off all of those priorities. The agreed syllabus has, has been delivered. The agree, it was launched at the agreed syllabus conference. And um, the area, obviously, now that we're probably moving into as part of our broader monitoring role is looking at the impact of the introduction of the agreed syllabus and, and from that identifying where schools would value further support on the implementation of the agreed syllabus. And I think that's one of the areas as well that we'll probably want to ask more questions about within um, the school monitoring survey. Um, because if we get that rich information back about how it's going with the implementation of the syllabus and also what further support is needed, that will help to set some priorities for um, the coming year. And I think that will link to priority two, which was about um, the development of a professional CPD programme to um, develop the quality of RE teaching in the city. Um, and I know, you know, sort of, um, there are... There are difficulties, I know, in releasing teachers to go to CPD events at the moment. And um, because schools are still very much in recovery and catch-up mode, it's, it is physically quite difficult for head teachers to allow numbers of teachers out at the moment. And also, not to forget that we're still seeing colleagues off with COVID at the moment. Um, but I think, again, if we are really going to focus on developing RE in schools, a, um, a well-developed CPD programme is one of the things that, that we should be targeting. Andy? Really, just to second that, and I, I, I completely agree, but equally sort of being, if you like, at the coalface, it is, it is still challenging and we are still working, as I would say, as a profession, from the teachers I speak to, it is just still very, very busy as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, I, I do wonder if sort of it, it may be worth considering going forward if video t and after school opportunities yeah. would get better attendance yeah. just because then it me reduces the staff travel and also makes that easier just as a just as a personal opinion on that Olivia um, just add as you know um, York Sacre was part of the regional our rehub that was um, had funding over the last four years, that funding's now come to an end. Um, but that did mean that 
when SACRE didn't have capacity to run its own training, teachers were able to access the regional training. And the model that we developed, which was partly a response to COVID, it wasn't necessarily the initial plan, but the curriculum conversation series that was um, Twilights on Zoom that were also recorded so that if teachers did, at, you know, that particular week feel that there were pressures, they still got the recording of the training and they could watch it in their own time. In this region worked very well and we did have... Um, at times, well, it was often 100 teachers booked on training from the different uh, local authorities in this region. So that's potentially a model to consider going forward. It tended to be about 4.15 until 5.30. So they were short chunks over a period of time, but with a particular theme. Um, and guest speakers and, then, and local people... Um, delivering that training but the feedback from that and I still get emails from teachers asking me when I'm going to do more but the reality is that um, that funding has come to an end so it's not possible to to con continue at this point but I think there's a, a, a potential a, an opportunity there for York Sacre to mm -hmm. continue some of that. And, and sorry just to add to that again the, the recording element is fantastic because actually you can have that playing and if you are weighed down you can be oh and you can have it on the screen whilst you're marking books or something and then pause it and rewind it because that is really beneficial so no thank you for doing all of that that's brilliant that's great thank you and I, I agree with you now we're finding that um, an awful lot of school meetings now are more accessible if they're virtual ones uh, because as you say Andy you've got to factor in the travel time and you, then you've got to find a car parking space and and all of those types of things um, and uh, yeah we've noticed that attendance at virtual meetings is much much higher than face to face so it is one of the things that we need to factor in but I also think there's still a value in at least once a year people being able to meet each other yeah. and and to to actually talk and see each other's schools occasionally as well so um, I think it's a, a blend really that, that we'd be encouraging oh sorry does York Sacre have finances to be able to support some of some of that training yeah we've got a very tiny budget annually um, and I think it's about um, prioritising within that. Um, and uh, yes, I think it is not taking on too much during the year, but, but deciding to do some things really well. I think if you do things virtually, they're relatively cost effective. I know people also have their time to put into it to make it work, but um, it's quite cost effective doing things virtually, Yeah, I think. Yeah, it is, definitely, <laughs> yeah. And, and one of the things, obviously, that we've um, not really got a handle on, the, on at the moment, and I think it's one of the things that perhaps we want to think about in terms of the monitoring role of SACRE, we don't have a really clear view of where the good practice is um, out in, in RE departments and schools. And um, I think in the coming year, it, it would be you know, sort of uh, one of my ambitions that we, we get clearer sighted on that. So we know the good practice of Taco and Andy, and uh, we know the, the good practice as well of Kirsty, but we, we, don't, we don't know across our schools the, the totality of what's taking place. Ben? That um, brings me to the annual conferences for primary and secondary schools, which I don't think is something we've achieved unless I've missed it. No, obviously uh, Andy has been coordinating a group of, of primary school teachers. Um, it's very, very difficult at the moment to actually bring people together in a conference. And, and as I say, it's, it's because um, it, it costs schools quite a lot to release people, um, both in terms of actually having the ability to backfill them at the moment because there's, uh, there are problems in actually accessing supply at the minute. And then you've also got to pay the £200 for the supply coming into school. So there's, uh, as well as whatever the cost of the conference is. Um, so there are some, some barriers at the minute to being able to, to get people to, to engage with some of those events. Um, and also... I hate to say it, but head teachers do make choices about which, which subject, subjects they are going to prioritise to go out to those events um, in, in a year. And um, 
it shouldn't be, but it sometimes ends up being that RE is not as high a, a, a priority as some of those other areas of the curriculum. So the issue is then if we've got um, training opportunities potentially which we may deliver online, but we think we want people to get together once, once a year, what do we use for what? Uh, I think that's it. I was really struck, and actually, I th Penny, I think you were there, um, about two months ago, half a dozen faith communities in York were asked to go and uh, do a 10, 15-minute mm. presentation for local chaplains and uh, mm. Church of England because we went at, I think, 7 o'clock at night, wasn't it, for two and a half hours. Boy, was it flat out. Uh, five or six different groups, the vicars moved, moved round and they got a very, very sharp, short introduction to... Almost like a speed dating event. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was it, yeah. And, and it, uh, you know, to me, it was very yeah. hard work, but I thought they went away with, oh, OK, there's some useful people mm. here, I understand. And they went away, really, with an idea of who, who to talk to next. So it seems to me that's something which you can only really deliver well in Absolutely. person. And might be valuable for conference yeah. and can be done in an evening or yeah. sort of mm. in the hour and a half after school. The training, I agree with Penny, mm. uh, can be done yeah. online. Yeah. I mean, um, Andy and I were at a, an, an event at York St John earlier this week, which was about equality and diversity. And um, it was a fabulous set of um, presentations. And, and each presentation was only 15 minutes, wasn't it? But, but it covered a lot of ground. And what really struck me as well was the, um, the way in which some of those presentations were led, led by young people from our schools. Um, so, you know, sort of that, that type of event, I think, works really, really well. And again, that's where we could get some of the best practice elements in, in as well, if it's led by um, schools who want to showcase what their young people are doing. Um, it's probably helpful to know that when we, when the last time we ran conferences, pre-COVID in 2019, in the primary schools, um, it were much better attended. So the last conference, if we, if we take the launch as something separate, um, the last primary school conference, uh, we filled the Pathfinder suite, it was about 50 teachers. The secondary conference was more challenging and, and what um, SACRI did was open that up to secondary schools in a wider area and then there were about 25 secondary teachers that come to, came to that. Um, but there have, there have been um, times in the past where Interfaith York and SACRI have worked together and done the Carousel of Faiths um, model at York St John um, with a, almost a, a table for the different representatives and teachers have come as part of the, the termly network groups. Um, and I've given some different suggestions of that in the paper that's later on. And I think at the moment, my feedback from schools generally is subject knowledge is the big thing that they want support with because particularly because of the Ofsted um, research review and that higher expectation in terms of knowledge progression. So I think your example there of that carousel of face I think would be, would be really well received by schools because it's not only an opportunity to meet with people in, in the local area, but also it, it's upskilling them in terms of their own subject knowledge for then delivery in the classroom. And there are some other SACRAs in the region that they call them carousel of faiths events and they offer that to schools within a locality and, and I think the benefit of York is that our geographical area is quite small mm. uh, compared to some um, SACRE so that you know I think that would be a really exciting thing to explore. No, I don't think you would need to in that sort of event. I think you do. I think you, and I think there would be a strength in it being both primary and secondary together, actually. Thanks. So, um, in terms of our existing development plan, um, you can see that actually an awful lot of what we set out to achieve has actually been achieved. As I say, there are some things that we'll probably want to take forward into the development plan 2022-24. Um, Olivia has kindly refreshed the template for the development plan and um, built those around the uh, NASACRE self-evaluation toolkit, the, the five key functions in there. And I think that provides quite a good structure 
really for um, the way that we set priorities for that, uh, that next two year period of the plan. Um, so as you can see, we've, we've got to improve management of SACRE and build the partnership between SACRE and other key stakeholders, which I think does link to our communications and, and how we do that. Promoting improvement in standards, quality of teaching and provision in RE, evaluating the effectiveness of the local agree, locally agreed syllabus. And, uh, you know, as I said, you know, sort of really getting under, we've had now the implementation of it, how is it actually going? And um, the improvement in the provision and quality of collective worship. And I know that's been a discussion point within um, SACRE meetings before. And contributing to cohesion across, across mm. the community and the promotion of social and racial harmony. Um, I know, again, Andy, you had a thought, didn't you, after we'd been at that event on Monday, which links directly to that, that fifth area. If it's an appropriate time to raise it, yeah. um, the one of the groups that approached the uh, the conference, um, I've brought the, the piece of paper because, uh, sorry, uh, speak up diversity in York, and what they have done is it's a not for profit charitable organisation, mm. and what they have done is they've approached um, the city, uh, the local authority, and have basically posed that at the moment York is or does have quite a, a wrath of racism. And their suggestion has been, and it was accepted by the body that saw them, that actually they look towards creating an action plan in which to support the uh, abolishment of racism or start to address it in, a, in perhaps a, a different manner or a stronger manner or which, which to ever. Um, I think there would be a potentially, uh, it may, may be potentially beneficial for that group to, to have a speaker come to Sacre. I'm aware that we have a sort of anti-racist units within our curriculum, um, but equally also this group um, may benefit to speak to sort of the range of, of people from different faiths and things that come, and from different backgrounds who come to Sacre, and it might also help Sacre uh, going forwards when we do come to re look at the syllabus again, on see if there's anything we can add to or improve upon our current units on racism. Um, now, be, obviously, before I invite them, uh, I wanted to raise it as something that potentially could come up for a future meeting. Um, should should yeah. the chair the other thing we were really struck by was there was a presentation from the uh, young Martin, young mayor from Hull from the city of Hull yes and her work has focused on developing um, an anti racist policy for schools um, and uh, again I know there are sacres in the country that have provided guidance about how to uh, to develop school policy in that area. So it, 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 again, may be something that we want to consider within our two-year development plan. And if I may just add to that, the, the conference in its whole talked a lot on um, the um, de decolonisation of mm. the curriculums. Um, and it was quite interesting in looking at... Um, looking at wider faith backgrounds, wider races, and their influence upon sort of world history, um, particularly looking at the origin of sort of uh, of gravity and things. And it's not Isaac Newton necessarily who thought that first, but actually someone of a different colour and faith. Uh, and I do think there is a lot of benefit to potentially looking at how that may influence future planning and things like that. Um, but again, I think that's very much at the beginning of the journey, from what I understood. Yeah. The organisation was called Speak Up Diversity York. Um, and my impression was that it's, it's a, new, a new group that has been given the mandate to look at how uh, your, uh, racism can be addressed within York to create an action plan on addressing racism with York, within York. Um, the benefit of them speaking or coming or having the opportunity to speak within the, the room may be, for, from our point of view, just to see what they're doing and see what they are doing as a group within York, which has been sort of recognised by the local authority. But from their point of view, it gives them almost a floor and opportunity to speak to people that they might not otherwise have access to, and there may be some good come from that. Um, not so it may be sort of that we can both benefit from that, but whether or not that's appropriate for SACRE, I must admit, I, as I say, I still I'm sort of a relatively new member. Um, I spoke to Maxine and she felt that potentially I had some uh, uh, positive, could potentially be quite positive. 
Okay, Ben. Um, I'd just like some more guidance from the council as to exactly which organisation it was. There are lots of different organisations out there claiming to speak on diversity and mm -hmm. religion, and some of uh, racism and some are very good, and some come with a political agenda. And I may well be confusing them with one that concerns me, um, but I'd like to stick to organisations we think we know really right. well. Yeah. I think can I yeah. make just one very qu quick comment on the development plan, which, you know, mm -hmm. I think is the, these are obvious areas. Almost as a matter of principle, I think our, where our greatest strength over the last uh, period has been, number one, so the management of SACRE and mm -hmm. the building partnership. And in fact, I think we've almost focused on that too much versus, right. yes. uh, you know, th two, four and five. Yeah. And so perhaps we can reorder them. Yes. And I know it's only just a brain dump at the moment. Um, just to explain that the template comes from the, because as you know, the annual report template has changed and there's a new template that we're required to complete for DFE uh, that NASACRE and DFE put together. And nationally, SACRES have been asked to um, connect their work to that self-evaluation tool and those five themes. So the template is purely to reflect that no expectation that there's the, the same weight in terms of areas of, of priority that would be for us as a SACRE to, to decide. And it may be that priority one, the communication plan is the one thing that goes in there, but there's more in other areas. But the reason why SACRES have been encouraged to do that is because that self-evaluation tool that we work through and the development plan then feeds into the heading, new headings that are in that um, statutory document that we have to provide once a year, which is why I suggested that our development plan fitted that format. And I think I agree with you, Ben. We did a lot of the heavy lifting in the last year around that first one, which was getting the terms of reference refreshed, mm. um, you know, sort of using Janie's uh, guidance about the constitution. So, um, yeah, a lot of that, I think, is done now and what we need to focus on is the partnership with key stakeholders so it's it's the communication bit I think more than than anything else on that one okay Darius just a small question um, this term the stakeholders I come across many places do we have a list of stakeholders Oh, there we go. Um, I will check on the NASACRI website whether they um, articulate what they mean by stakeholders. I suppose as, as a, an individual SACRI, we might have our own view about who our stakeholders are as well. But traditionally, I would say in SACRIs, the four groups that are represented are, are partly those stakeholders in terms of those different organisations and then schools um, but I think it's an, it's an interesting question isn't it because the, as you, you're right that the word is used but I'm not aware that NASACRE defines um, the term stakeholders in the context of SACRES on its website. I just hope that uh, your interfaith and uh, your racial equality network come under those headings. They were certainly referenced in our annual report last year as a key key partnerships, so I would, I would absolutely presume that it was Darius. Okay. okay. Yeah, so what we're suggesting, as I say, is that we go for a few focused actions that we are able to deliver, and, um, you know, so, so that, that will really help in terms of understanding the quality of RE in, in York, um, but also... Um, ensuring that uh, we have moved forward on some of the, the other areas, like um, Area 5. What I would suggest in terms of the way that we draft the, the actions is... Um, I'm going to make a suggestion that Olivia and myself actually uh, just work together on a draft version of the new development plan, circulate it for comment, and um, then, as I say, at the next SACRE meeting, we, we can actually um, 
really uh, nail down and adopt it. So I'd like to make that suggestion, but obviously if people feel strongly that you'd like to um, discuss some actions now, then uh, please do. Right, so we've had a, a proposal. Uh, are people happy with that or do we want to? I'm getting uh, general. I think as the next meeting's in October, there might be the opportunity to send out oh, yeah. a series of, of iterations yeah. before we get to the final um, version that we sign off at the next meeting. Probably, probably stupid because I'm feeling more happy having had my big event of the year out of the way. Um, <laughs> but if, if you would like input from a member in yes. that, then I would be happy to be involved yeah. in right. the process or just come into Crofts. That's okay. great, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Much yeah. For that. yeah. One of the things as well that Councillor Cuthbertson really helpfully did was um, to model um, the a self-evaluation, which um, also helps to bring to life some of those actions within that uh, 2022 development plan. Um, and really um, is that example of the way in which self-assessment would then be reported within um, our, our annual report. So I think this is a really good model of, um, of right. the way that it's brought self, that self-evaluation very much to life. Okay. Right. Thanks for that. So if you want to turn to item yeah. eight. Uh, just, just to finish item seven, Chair, right. one of the things that we do need to do in order to um, get some detail into, the, into both the development plan but also our annual report is um, the, the work that we need to do on the, uh, the questionnaire to be sent to schools. Again, Councillor Cuthbertson has been in touch with Business Intelligence and they would be able to um, help us in terms of hosting that, that questionnaire and, and then doing some analysis from it. Um, the current questionnaire, I know Olivia spent a lot of time on, but it is very, very detailed. And um, what I always feel with questionnaires is um, if you have got to put in a lot of free text, that sometimes becomes a bit of an issue about how much time you're going to spend actually filling it in. And uh, uh, also, if it's on the council website, and, uh, and you on, are extremely time limited. You are, how yeah. It will keep how long it will keep open for exactly. whatever document you're filling yeah. in. And I do want to make it as accessible as possible for school mm. colleagues so that we do get some rich data back, uh, but without it being seen as being too onerous. Uh, so, um, again, views on what we should focus on as part of that, that questionnaire and um, particularly how it will help us to design things like the annual programme of CPD. All right, Ian. Uh, thank you, Chair. I had a helpful comment from Business Intelligence uh, only yesterday. Um, but one of the things that they were quite clear about was that the amount of data that's actually held within the Council's Business Intelligence system and its nature, sometimes you just can't put um, free text in there and, and get anything intelligible out of it. And I mean, that might suggest that you may, we might want to go to an AI type system, an artificial intelligence based system. But I think that's probably overkill for the first couple of years. I think we should concentrate on getting us a questionnaire that's uh, simple to complete, has got quantitative, where possible, data rather than qualitative information. So less free text, more, even if there were four or five choices of words to describe where we got to, which you could then classify as good, not so good, middling, poor, very poor, um, that kind of analysis. And then it's, it's, um, it's possible to reword questions in that format. So I'm happy to put some time in to, to talk to Maxine and anybody else. Decker, looking, you're looking very interested too. I'm just happy to suggest that if, if, if it would be suitable for, for the, the committee to, uh, I'll be happy to go and look at the questionnaire that we did previously, having seen it from both sides as a teacher and for having yeah. filled it in, and then as well as having used it here, I can see the, the, the questions that I was happy to answer and found easy to answer as well, as then when we mm -hmm. used it here, what was actually useful for us 
data-wise. So actually, looking at from both sides, I'd be more than happy to. That's that. That would be so helpful. Everything's calmed happen. down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if, look if, at that and sort of look at it from those two angles, and sort of recommend what would be a useful question or, or how yes. it might be changed, yeah. or just a few recommendations. I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah. So if we have a working group, and as I understand it, sort of Maxine, Olivia, mm. Ian, and Taco. Um, just to Are say, volunteering? I'm, ha I'm happy to talk right. to the uh, primary network group okay. on that right. chat. That's okay. Yeah. And see if they've got any feedback on that. I've sort of made a note. That's okay. All right. Any other volunteers for this working group? Oh, right. If it's useful, I'm it, more than happy to look at Honestly, it well. yeah. Right. We want to make it as accessible as possible to our re teachers so that yeah. we get that data back. I yeah. think like anything that's shorter definitely yeah. right. is better. Yeah. And then I think it also helps to look at the data as well. Because mm. yeah. if you've got so much free text, then you don't necessarily see trends as much. So. That's right, yeah. Okay, that sounds like uh, a plan. Okay, that's brilliant. Right. So I will be in touch to sort of try and pull that together. Um, and I know you've got a busy few weeks at the minute, so we'll, we'll choose a quieter time to have a look at it. Right, so that's... That brings item seven to a close, does it? Not? Yes, it does. Right. Okay, item eight. Olivia? Um, I, as always, have pulled together some of the key um, national updates on RE um, to, to keep us informed as SACRE. I think the most, there, there are a number of significant things happening um, nationally in terms of RE development that um, will be particularly significant for us as a SACRE um, as we are looking to review and develop a, a new locally agreed syllabus um, because that conversation will start in the next couple of years to have it ready um, in its five year window. And it, in particular, the Religion and Worldviews Project is, is really quite significant um, nationally. <clears throat> Many of you um, will know from um, previous meetings about the Commission of uh, RE's work um, at, at thinking about national entitlement for RE for all schools, and this is really born out of that. And there is currently a draft handbook, and the link to it is, is on the paper, that are for syllabus writers and syllabus makers. And of course, SACRE, by its nature, that's one of our statutory responsibilities. Um, the, the next phase of the project has just started, where um, nationally groups of, of teachers and writers have been um, uh, commissioned, um, they've applied for and, and, and been appointed to write a series of um, resources and units of work that exemplify, if you like, the theory um, that sits behind this. I think it's a particularly important um, national development and I think it was exemplified um, really well when Mark spoke at the beginning of the meeting and talked about the different Buddhist worldviews that there are, both um, particularly in the, in the West but also globally, and that need for RE to be able to help pupils to understand that diversity of worldview within religions as well as um, between. And so that's where this, this work is based. There is also um, a real theme in this in terms of decolonisation of the curriculum that Andy mentioned and that sense of having a, a, a very clear view about um, personal and organised worldviews and what that means and not having, if you like, textbook RE and challenging stereotypes and misconceptions. So this will be really significant for us and I would encourages us SACRE to consider whether we spend some time over the next year engaging with some of this, whether that's guest speaker, whether that's looking at, at different aspects of the document and talking together about our particular perspectives on it, because it really will inform the curriculum that will be um, required to provide for our pupils ongoing. The other um, significant thing that we don't necessarily have answers to yet is the white paper mm. and the, the, the implications of that for RE. I think um, it wasn't necessarily um, understood or reflected in the white paper how it relates to the statutory nature of SACRES and our responsibility for um, determining curriculum because of where RE sits in law. And nationally, the RE policy unit are um, working with DFE and liaising with DFE to get some clarity about what this might mean 
um, in the future. The Commission for RE, of course, did suggest that the, the nature of SACRAIS might change, but that they would still exist if there was a national entitlement. But we don't, uh, as yet, have a sense that that is where the DfE is going to move. So if RE is going to continue to be locally determined within that academy's agenda, I think there are some big questions, I suppose, to be answered in terms of what that means for the the role of SACRAIS in that <coughs> monitoring of standards, because technically that means including academies, even though academies have freedom in terms of, of choosing their own curriculum. So I think there is some, some questions there, I think, that um, nationally are being um, explored and will be um, responded to because of that unique role we have in terms of determining curriculum. I think in York, um, we are, we are very fortunate that because of the nature of the partnership of schools, that the majority of academies do continue to use the locally agreed syllabus in, in, in other local authorities. That's not necessarily the case, or if, if um, it is multi-academy trusts that have a group of schools in a larger geographical area, they may choose to invest in writing their own syllabus for RE, for example. So at the moment, we do have a syllabus that the majority of our schools work with and therefore they partner with. Um, but there are obviously some significant structural and legal questions in terms of the relation of, of our role that will emerge. And so I will, of course, let you know if, if, if there are any more updates on that. Is there a time frame for when the white paper will be published? So the white paper has been right. published. Um, and um, the um, bill is, is going through... Yeah, the school's bill is going through Parliament yeah. at the, the moment. moment. Yes. Right. But, yeah. but the white paper itself has that. been published, and it's particularly the section in that about an aspiration for all schools to be academies by 2030 that has a direct um, relationship with mm. our statutory role mm. in terms of curriculum. Uh, and that's the bit that's unclear at the moment as to what the, the, the guidance will be about the role of SACRAIS going forward. Right. And obviously, you know, in the white paper, it does say that there's going to be a national curriculum authority, um, and we, we don't know whether that will incorporate RE. Um, the, historically, um, our, because RE is legally, we're responsible for determining the curriculum for our schools. It's that, that wonderful, <laughs> special role that we have. Um, there have been national guidance documents in the past that have guided syllabus writers, such as this draft handbook for religion and worldviews, but they are just that. They're not, they're not um, statutory. Um, and so, again, it's understanding if there is this national curriculum authority, will they work with the, the key organisations in terms of RE to enable key guidance documents? So it could be the draft handbook becomes the the document that the curriculum authority recommends to syllabus writers. But if the current legal framework exists, then SACRAIS will still technically have a responsibility to produce an agreed syllabus, but may not have the body of schools that use it. So it's just that at the moment that it may feel so a long you, way off. So but that there could be a situation where there is a SACRI but that no school in York follows its curriculum. Yes, and there are yeah. local authorities um, in, in the country the where case. that's already the case, yeah. and they have some academies that adopt the syllabus and other academies adopt a different syllabus. So it is quite a unique um, position that RE holds in law, um, and I'm sure there will be um, varying views around the table about what is helpful and what is unhelpful about that, but this is more just to make us aware that there are some... You know, there are some big questions and, and we need to be aware of those in terms of what that might mean for our work over the next five to ten years. OK. We shall await with bated breath decision from government. Yes. Right. Um, Nasakre, um, the Nasakre conference did raise it. Right. Um, the Nasakre conference has, has made it... Uh, made SACRA is aware of it. Um, the RE policy unit has already been engaging with the DfE on the matter, and I, I've quoted for you the things that we know already, but I would imagine over the next year to 18 months there will be um, national documentation that, that gives us a sense of where it's going. And you'll see that there, there's been quite a lot of work. I've, I've put some other things in my paper here in terms of the policy unit and the Rethink RE campaign and some of the research that they've been doing 
what is an interesting one, I think, for us as SACRE to be aware of in terms of our monitoring standards in RE is there has been an increase nationally in the number of pupils at Key Stage 4 doing RE, and that does seem to be um, pretty much directly linked to the new Ofsted framework and those um, expectations in terms of quality of education judgment and schools being compliant that all pupils on roll have RE in each year group. And so we are starting to see schools nationally that once um, perhaps didn't provide RE for all pupils or had taken RE off the timetable, that they are having to relook at those decisions that they made. And there are quite a number of in secondary RE vacancies around the country. We're seeing a, an increase in, in schools employing RE specialists again, and we're seeing an, an uptick in terms of um, pupils studying right. RE. Okay, any questions? No, thank you for that. Um, item nine is correspondence on complaints yeah. determinations. We've received no complaints or determinations in the period since the last meeting. So. Very good. So item 10. Um, links actually plan? back to seven. So uh, yes. we've, we've got a plan in place there um, for um, presenting a or drafting a work plan um, and uh, we'll link that to the development of the, uh, the, the development process. Plan. Yeah. We'll include that, right, that's helpful. Uh, future meeting dates, uh, I'll quote there, um, Ian's helpfully pointed out that the, uh, the February meeting should be in 2023. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it should. That's, uh, so wonderful. The, well, the, the, the May meeting it seems to be a rather odd day mm -hmm. in between election and yeah. annual council. That, yeah, it uh, does. Yeah. It, it might be better to push I'll, that. I'll speak to Ange about that after, one. Yeah. After yeah. annual yeah. council. This group, group D could, could well be very different. Could, yes. yes. Yeah. The will yeah, of the people, exactly. it could be entirely yeah. different. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, Fiona, if, if we could um, raise that, you know, sort of with democratic services, so, just have a look at the dates. Yeah. Yeah. The other but, thing we do very often fit in as well, obviously, is a, um, a fourth meeting around about December just to sign off the annual report. Um, so, it, so it might be worth looking at if, we're, if there's going to be a December meeting to move the February meeting to March, and then that it's, a, it's a more even spread if the May meeting is going to be pushed. Mm, pushed a bit later. A bit later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. People happy with that. Um, item 12, urgent business. Um, ben did raise an item okay. that hadn't been covered um, to the inter faith week. So I, I mean, I was only preparing for meeting, and when I read that, I thought that seemed very thorough preparation. I, I, I thought, uh, the, the, well, it was because the suggestion seemed yes. like a good one, that we should liaise with the interfaith uh, week, yes. um, and we should have that as an item on this meeting. But I don't know what the thinking was, because I wasn't at that meeting. Right. But Penny? I don't know if Darish does or Penny does. I think it relates back to the conversation last year that we had with interfaith um, York about looking at a way of working together to do something that was schools facing to engage with schools um, and so I don't know Penny if you if you know what if there's any particular thinking already within Interfaith York I think this something could be built into the development plan in terms of that stakeholders mm. and um, wider engagement mm. but I know there's been certainly um, a hope that we could work together yes yeah, so I think that is, is it, that is exactly what it was referencing uh, which we have had a discussion about. Um, we, uh, we've had some challenges in, at Interfaith this year, personal members with family and health situations. Um, and our chair had a, a couple of bereavements, and so it's kind of put things a little bit kind of askew. Normally, we would be very on track with our meetings, wouldn't we, in discussion. Mm -hmm. have a meeting tomorrow night. Um, so... It's something that we can raise. Dee has it. She's our vice chair, and she has it noted 
about doing something in Interfaith Week. She usually takes the reins of Interfaith Week and I work with her. Have um, you got the dates for Interfaith Week? Interfaith Week, yes. It's, it's the, it starts on Remembrance Sunday. I think it's the 13th of November right. this year. In York, with, with how many things that we do in Interfaith Week, we're actually starting the Saturday before. So we start uh, on the Well, 12th. That, was, that was going to be my personal plea is that Remembrance <laughs> Sunday is a long day yes, it already is. Yes, absolutely. to have a long event on the evening yeah. it makes it a bit No, uh, we're totally with you on that and, and in fact that's something we've talked about isn't it not, not doing that even for our benefits <laughs> as well it is a long day so, yeah. so we will start on the Saturday we're actually going to have our, our tree planting on the Saturday, so you're welcome to come along. Um, we're going to plant some more trees in our little interfaith uh, space on the uh, Clifton by Clifton Bridge, isn't it? I, I, um, I, and then avoiding we'll the flood defence bund. Oh, please. <laughs> you, yes, the, the the saplings had to be moved one year. Oh, did they? Yes. So, so all the faith groups are always encouraged to do something as an event during Interfaith Week. And, the, you know, there's a fantastic programme of, mm. you know, dozens of events. And it just strikes me that maybe this is an opportunity for us to do an event as Sacre for the public, as well as for schools, just ex talking about our work, getting some feedback. Um, it would be a really sort of easy hit. I think the carousel of face idea yeah. that we spoke about earlier, I think would be a really interesting thing to explore for teachers during that week um, and that might be a way of doing something facing so perhaps that we need to join it up with the development plan conversation and make sure that it's in the development plan right. so that we're holding ourselves to making sure that we, we do something. Okay. Uh, and the thing that we discussed was having some kind of competition with schools um, that, that we had to pre-plan for that to get out to schools before uh, they finished the summer term and then going forward and moving that forward so they move forward in September, October, ready for November, and sort of interlinking SACRE with interfaith uh, with a school's competition based around some kind of theme that would be a religious theme like the Golden Rule, for example, Dee suggested that we could do some art or some, something or writing competition or, or something that would engage children uh, in thoughts about faith and, and raise the profile of all of us really in the process. Right. I just are we about to be locked in? No, um, the gentleman who does the technology is trying to get back into the site, so he's just going to get his cards and we'll buzz him in. Right. Sorry. <laughs> just, <laughs> right, Darry. I've forgotten now what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's um, this is a good idea, but I, from the interfaith perspective, of course, we have got our secretary, our vice chair, and so on to discuss that. But who from the sacre will sit at the table and discuss it, how it's going to be done? Um, yeah, yeah Penny, uh, Penny um, met with me last year, and that was taken back to interfaith. But then obviously it was put on pause um, last year because of um, other reasons. Mm -hmm. So um, I think obviously Penny and yourself are representatives from Interfaith York speaking into SACRE, but there's an opportunity for any, you know, a working party or what, whatever is needed to be set up and, and people can volunteer to do that um, when, when Interfaith mm -hmm. York know what particular aspects they want to work on then we can put it to yeah, all can members pull together as a joint group just to to begin to look at it okay so as a uh, an item from today we can yeah. ask the volunteers yeah. for that working party okay. right so penny you will be able to send a note about what the plans are yes yes, yes. and and then so that will be a, an action point from today. Right. I haven't had any other urgent business. I'm not taking any urgent. So um, thank you all for your presence tonight. Thank you.